What if you grew up knowing that you were perfectly beautiful, that your sexuality was natural and joyful, and that every sensual and sexual and reproductive interaction in your life would be done with reverence and freedom of choice? Moreover, what if there was no question that you, living as you do in a girl body, would experience total inclusion and equal opportunity everywhere you went, that there would be no barriers to your success due to your embodiment? And can you imagine if your mother and grandmother had felt that way too? This is the Rose Woman Podcast, Provocations for Living Happy and Free Your Whole Life Long, and I'm your host, Christine Marie Mason. Basically a human who's interested in helping people love their bodies more, get super curious about their lives, and live in more peace and purpose and power. Today's episode is part of a series of solo shows on healing transgenerational and cultural trauma. Last episode, I introduced a whole bunch of ideas and some healing practices. And today I'm going to speak specifically to inherited traumas around gender and life in a female body. I could, I just want to say, also do a show like this completely on the inherited traumas of life in a male body because they go hand in hand, almost like a polarity. But today I'm talking about the research on women and especially where it lives in us as sexual and body shame. I'm going to throw a lot at you. Some of it controversial. Some of it will sound a little bit like shorthand. You might want to check the footnotes or the show notes for that. Uh, But, you know, take it on face value initially and just see how it resonates with you. Now, depending on your age, you might have had different experiences of growing up in a female body. I was an American woman growing up in the 70s and 80s, and I experienced a ton of confusion, both in the short term, like short term suffering and shame and long term negative consequences from a culture that both shamed women's sexuality while at the same time rewarding sexual attractiveness. There were so many unwritten rules and almost no direct guidance for me or my friends. You know, we we were living in the suburbs of Chicago at that time, I think. I had also been lived part of my teenage life in Iran, where women were shrouded in Shador. And neither of those environments gave me much good information, not sex education from a factual and scientific standpoint, other than here's your period and here's how conception happened. It certainly didn't do anything to give me an understanding of my sexual energy or this incredible upwelling of power that I felt coming into adolescence. And nor did it give me any understanding of the emotional life that accompanies dating and sexual interaction and the longing for connection. For me, that combination led to early pregnancy and teenage motherhood. I had three kids by the time I was 22 with my sweetheart I met at 16, my husband, And throughout my 20s and early 30s, I went into the world of big business and advanced education. And even there, in these places that seem so rational, I continue to navigate being a sexual creature and dance around what in the parlance of today would be considered bias and violations of consent at every turn. I didn't have a word for it then, so I thank the women who have come since. And hardest, of course, was the internalized shame that I carried. But then in my mid-30s, I began to seek freedom, resolution, and peace in this area of my life, doing deep forgiveness work, learning about sex positivity, sexual design, body positivity, neo-tantra, and more. And now as the mother of six children, three boys, and one daughter and two stepdaughters, I'm really committed. I'm I'm very committed to passing on my wisdom and not my suffering in er in this area so nobody has to live through what I did. And I hope that this extends to you. So even today, I want to say, five decades since what was called the sexual revolution of the 70s, the surveys and data that I have gathered show that my customers in the U.S. and Canada, 25 to 80, in all states, urban and rural, all races, all creeds, cisgendered and lesbian, bi, transgender, and women in general, still have tremendous knowledge gaps and traumas and shames around their bodies and sexuality. It creates totally unneeded health issues, a lower quality of life, psycho-spiritual and emotional distress, unsatisfactory sexual experiences, and even vulnerability to sexual violence and predation. I feel that as long as sexual taboos exist and are reinforced in all of these institutions we've created, education and media and economics and culture and politics and medicine, and as long as these stories live unchallenged in us, in women themselves, the suffering will continue. The shaming of women between women, by women to themselves, and by men, is being unwound. It is happening. And I'm going to talk a lot about that today. 
And I know that when it is unwound, everyone will benefit. Now, you probably know by now the issue mattered so much to me that I started a women's intimate wellness company, Rosebud Woman, and the company provides intimate skin and body products along with this podcast and books and blogs, all aimed at changing inherited and unhelpful belief systems around the body and sex. For example, when I wrote the invitation to daily intimate self-care, we did an accompanying free course with guided prompts to help women parse out the hidden beliefs about their bodies. Questions such as, who does your body belong to? Or what are your beliefs around pleasure? Or what do cultural beauty standards do to you? The prompts were based on research around unhelpful beliefs and led to a lot of self-examination. I'll link to that in the show notes in case you want to do a deeper investigation into what's living inside of your unique brain. And the other thing I want to highlight is that it's not just about what men do to women, about men doing something. The way women are entrained into the culture is through their mothers and grandmothers and other women. A large portion of the struggles between mothers and daughters that I've witnessed, they aren't about the personal conflict, although it can seem that way, but about the enrollment of the daughter into the mother's worldview and frame, which isn't of itself a product of many, many generations of defended sexuality, objectification, indirect and sideways power achievement, and a lack of general education on alternative ways to be. So as a girl attempts to break free of the stories that are in her face, fear and conflict often arise. So I feel like a big part of healing collective trauma in the feminine is to do forgiveness work and heal the maternal line. Again, that's an entire subject in and of itself. I'll also link to a maternal line forgiveness practice in the show notes if you're interested in that. So I want to move into the next part of the episode, which involves me getting a little history teachy for a few moments, okay? I'm going to share a brief background so that we can all understand the extent of the immunity to change in the culture that we're up against. So there are multiple long arc narratives at work in the current attitudes towards women and sex. And the first is probably obvious to everyone. It's patriarchal bloodlines instead of matriarchal. So in father ruled, patriarchal, capitalist, and clan, or individualistic societies, the inheritance is determined by the bloodline. In this kind of culture, men seek dominance over female reproductive capacity so that they can ensure that their own child, not that of another man, will receive legacy asset control, including the family name, for example. But this is not the case in many matriarchal societies where the children are cared for by many of the men of the group. And in one example, any man who has ever copulated with a woman is considered to be one of the child's many fathers. So patriarchal bloodlines still with us still behind a lot of the narratives around women's freedom sexually. And the second narrative, which kind of grows out of that one, is the fallout of the possession of women, which created a second-class citizenship for half of the world's population. A man's interests were presumed to represent a woman's interests. So for thousands of years, women had no independent right to vote, few civil or economic rights. And in some cultures, and even today in some cultures, sexual transgressions by women were punished by expulsion from the community or other um, harms, even, even death. So that combined creates a really difficult framework to break out of. Another third element, part of the long story, is the masculinization of divinity, especially in Christianity and Islam, and the loss of the powerful female deities of many tribal cultures. Other than Mary, mother of Jesus, who is not incidentally exalted for her virginity, there were few examples of holy women in the West, and those that were were often martyrs, not powerful creators, lovers, or transformers. Even Joan of Arc, who was later canonized, was put to death in part for not being gender conforming. She insisted on wearing men's clothing, for example, and that was one of the reasons they burned her at the stake. You know, you're getting some redeification or reemergence of the Magdalene, for example, and other characters in the Christian Bible, but it's taking some serious attention and unwinding. So you've got patriarchy, possession, masculine deities, and then a fourth force after the Industrial Revolution was the emergence of an entire culture that was separate from the home, whereas people used to work very integrated by gender when you created an industrial workforce. The, the culture that is based and biased on, toward linearity and efficiency, towards mind and data and structure, which are typical qualities of male embodiment, 
and simultaneously averse to cyclical or intuitive gut flow states, which are typical of female embodiment, uh, began to really take hold. So things in general started to get disconnected from nature and earth and life in cycles. And there's a much bigger topic in there about how that's impacted how women are viewed, women who are so tied to our biology. So things began to change really in the mid 20th century due to many concurrently emerging factors, including women's suffrage, which was achieved in America a little over 100 years ago, women's increasing economic power. Did you know, for example, that women only received the nationwide right to have a credit card in their own name or to hold a mortgage, for example, in the 1970s, so 50 years in all of human history? <laughs> The emergence of psychology as a field of study that talked about sex and its role in broader behavior was really influential. The advent of the birth control pill in 1972 was the first time in human history that women could reliably choose to have sex without reproduction. And did you know that the birth control for the first many years that it was on the market was only available to married women through a prescription? Because they thought it would encourage women who were unmarried to have sex outside of marriage. So it would, even the introduction of the pill, such a revolutionary concept, was, all, was still wrapped in controlling women's sexual behavior. So all of this was happening, and out of it you get this sexual revolution of the 60s to the 80s, when people really first began to celebrate the erotic in public. And during this time, and even slightly earlier, you started getting milestone publications that were impacting the collective mind. Like you had the Kinsey Report, Our Bodies, Ourselves, The Joy of Sex, along with magazines like Playboy and Hustler, which began the mainstreaming of what today we would call porn, where you were showing images of this vital and important part of people's lives. Unfortunately, the way that it was done was highly focused on objectification of the feminine, but you know, it was starting to get out there that we could talk about sex. So we began to shift, uh, but like all forward movements, there was a counter movement, and that counter movement came in part in the 80s uh, due to the AIDS crisis and the emergence of the purity movement in the evangelical church. So the sexual revolution, it seems, had moved too fast for the culture to absorb the impact. Sexual freedoms were gained without changing the structures in which they lived, such as the container of marriage and monogamy or child support, or without examining the underlying religious shame, what I call pathological religiosity, which is separating and punishing, topic for another time, uh, without changing healthcare biases or without really addressing education. So you don't have a lot, even today, uh, education in the relational aspects of sexuality. So sex changed, but often the inner life of women and the culture stayed stuck. And the dissonance in that is still showing up today in things such as common and massive trolling and slut shaming of women who have a public facing persona. It shows up in the ongoing battle uh, to regulate women's reproductive life. It shows up as women and babies living in poverty as men are relieved of the emotional and financial responsibility of child rearing through the modern structures of sexuality and non-monogamy. And even the insanity of the incel which stands for involuntarily celibate, a misogynist movement of men. Uh, that is to say, guys who can't get laid, probably because they are misogynist, uh, are all, th that's just another example of the way the culture stayed stuck as sexual freedom was gained. So merely six years ago, uh, Leora Tenenbaum wrote this response to Slut the Play, a Broadway show where she said, a teenage girl today is caught in an impossible situation. She has to project a sexy image and embrace to some extent a slutty identity. Otherwise, she risks being mocked as an irrelevant prude. But if her peers decide that she has crossed an invisible, constantly shifting boundary and become too slutty, she loses all credibility. And can I say, that does not sound that different from the early 1980s to me. Now it seems here we are at another threshold with a pressing opportunity to unwind the immunity to change in ourselves and others on this really important issue. You guys all remember the 2016 election and the outrageous grab them by the pussy scandals and all the very public sexual abuse narratives by men in power that have happened since then, Weinstein, Epstein, and others. Uh, you know, you remember how Me Too just exploded testimony, life stories, firsthand stories from out of the woodwork from women worldwide, and ex how that movement exposed this pervasive tightrope that women are walking wherever work, 
power dynamics and sexuality are coming together. The Me Too movement was overwhelming and it felt like a dam breaking, uh, which is an important and perfect next step in what has to come to unwind these stories. Because unless you tell the truth about what happened and you begin the dialogue, like this is the way it is. I'm not going to hide it anymore. Unless you do that, there's no possibility of change. So that's the backstory. And I want to talk about five groups of leverage points now for where the old story is being transformed in powerful institutional environments and mention some of the people doing this work. Because what I want to point out is that this is how change happens. It happens at the edges when people change stories in their own minds first and then they begin carrying those stories out into the communities that they are part of and in their professional domains and very gradually the culture adjusts. So if you find as you're listening to this that you're carrying any of the old stories I mentioned, see if you can jot it down or make a mental note and maybe shift it to a new story or an emerging story. I'm going to also tell you in each set of examples some of the people that I love, many of them have already been guests on the pod, that are part of this unwinding of sexual shame in American women and creating more freedom for men at the same time. So I'm going to start with the one that is the most controversial, and it is changing our religious inheritance. It's the number one leverage point for unwinding sexual shame. Because even if you're not quote unquote religious now, my guess is you've picked up a lot of messages that were influenced by uh, the cultures that came before you. So here are some old stories from religion. Women should be virgins until marriage. Sex is only for procreation, not pleasure or connection. Sex outside of marriage is a sin. Women are second class citizens. They can't lead in the church. They can't preach. Women's bodies are the purview of male regulators. Women are the reason for the original separation from paradise. Those are some of the stories. You can probably think of a lot more. I mean, the Madonna whore thing I didn't even include in there, or Mary and Martha. You know, it's sort of the two models of how to be a good woman. The new stories that are coming out in many parts of the religious world are, our bodies are nature, and as such are perfectly ordered already, thank you. Sexuality is natural and desirable. Pleasure and connection are God's plan. Sacred sexuality is another piece of this, that the body and sex can not only be acceptable, but in and of themselves are a pathway to experience divinity and connection. That consent and sovereignty as a woman replace others' authority and control. We see a lot of emergence in the new story of female clergy, the Magdalene movement and Christianity the emergence of spiritual but not religious to counteract some of the things that have happened to women in the frameworks of the patriarchal religions. And then you see a huge movement reclaiming tribal, pagan, and other goddess traditions happening everywhere. I'll tell you a few people that you know we mentioned before. I mentioned Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber and a host of other mainstream Protestant and evangelicals who are leading the movement to unwind purity culture. I've got a whole piece on that. She wrote a book called Shameless. Very, very good. Examples um, that I can think of from people who have stepped away from the mainline churches they were part of are people who, like Nicole Hodges, who we interviewed last month, and many others who are leading movements to reimagine virginity, not as something that can be taken or lost but rather just speaking to the gradual development of sexual agency. She calls it a sexual debut, part of an ongoing process of self-acceptance and self-love and learning like who you are in the sexual domain through experimentation as you become an adult in full. She said something like virginity, you know, no, what, what's, this is going to sound really crass, but I'm going to say it anyway. Nobody's dick is important enough to change a part of my identity. And the idea that you're a virgin or not a virgin is exactly that. Did you get penetrated? And if you are, your identity has changed. And that whole story is one that Nicole, for example, is trying to unwind. And then you have whole new spiritual viewpoints, like the schools of temple arts and sacred sex and sex-positive spiritual centers that are emerging all over the country, as well as churches that have just stepped out and said, love is love is love is love. And your sexual design is part of 
the reason there's so much beauty and diversity and humanity and everyone's welcome here. So I am seeing a change. I hope you're seeing a change. But if any of those original good girl stories live in you, they will definitely show up in your bedroom and in your boardroom. If you're a guy too, FYI. All right, then I'm going to go on. Ready? Leverage point group two, media. So female sexual norms in media, the old stories were women are valued for their beauty, their reproductive capacity, or their sexuality. Almost all the characters in films and TV were defined, used to be defined in their relationship to men. Think about the ratio of speaking to uh, words that women speak in a film versus men. One kind of beauty prevailed for a very long time. And even though that diversity and representation has changed significantly in the last decade, if it was happening while you were of an influential age, it probably still lives in you. Thin, tall, 36, 24, 36, you know, often f- represented as fair. Another thing that formed our patterned impressions of what women could do in the media were cinematic tropes that objectified women, usually with some dimension of loose versus contained sexuality at play. Think about it. Manic pixie, sexy tomboy, the vamp, the good wife, the sex worker with a heart of gold. This sort of dance between loose and contained sexuality seemed to be at the core essence of female characters that were offered to us, I guess, as an imprint. But in the new story and in the emerging story in media, this is what we're looking at. Women are valued for intelligence and character and charisma. They are defined as sovereign. There are many kinds of beauty and love in all of these places, all body types, all ages, all races. People have a range of sexual expressions. People have friendly, funny sex like real people do. They have speaking parts. Women have speaking parts. They're complex original characters, and they don't just talk about men. And in the new story, the movies also show men who are equitable and accountable and present and all of that stuff will change the shaming of our sexuality and our desires and our bodies um, for the next generation. But if we got it early, it's probably still living us in us. Uh, you got in this category, Gina Davis, whose Institute on Gender and Media has been an amazing gatherer of data and a big driver and activism driver in media. Jennifer Siebel Newsom's movement, Misrepresentation, talks about, shows young girls and what impact is on them of seeing these images represented as the way to be when it's so far from who they are. And and we also see this sort of, instead of that part getting better with Instagram and all of the filters, you're, you're seeing people trying to change themselves to be some scrubbed filtered kind of beauty and not just the reality of their amazing selves so I feel like particularly with such an image heavy time the media component is really important and then we also interviewed Cindy Gallup remember that on make love not porn um, who talks about real world sex and what it does when people see real sex happening and how it changes takes the pressure off and shows them how to try new things but doesn't you know, make it into a, a a big drama, high pressure situation. So even just the normalization of showing regular people making love is a big part of changing the media story. Now I'm going to open up another category. And this one also could be very uh, challenging to your dominant belief system. So hold on to your hats because it's education. The old story is that it's the parent's choice if a child gets education about their body or sexuality. That sex ed is optional. Did you know that education isn't standardized? uh, That 23 states still don't mandate sex ed at all? Uh, You can listen to an old pod I did, uh, the intro to the April Davis one, uh, What's New in Vagina Land, that really goes off on on, uh, sex education. I was shocked to learn this. And the in the old model of sex education, information when it is presented as clinical rather than relational, which does very, very little to help an adolescent uh, navigate their sexual feelings, their relational feelings. It does almost nothing to speak to how your attachment styles, the things you're learning in your home will impact the way that you engage in your sexuality either. And so it seems to be very... Um, Uh, right for change. So in the new story, all children have the right to be educated about their own bodies, period. That it's a form of child abuse almost to not have your child educated. 
that the information they are trained on is highly specific, detailed, and relational, and that sex education and body education are done in an age-appropriate way from a very young age, especially, especially, especially consent education. What do you want? Are you a yes or a no? And, and that question of like, what do you desire can be as young as three, that you get to say no to Uncle Joe. You get to say yes to what you want to eat and no to what you don't want to eat. You get to decide what you want to wear. If you're tired, you get to say, I'm tired and I want to go home and not be told to be quiet. There's a whole thing about respecting the young and, you know, particularly by 12 or 13, you cannot expect a girl to show up fully formed at 12 or 13 without having learned her yes and her no and that it was all right to have boundaries and express her desire and be able to do it when she grows boobs and suddenly be able to say no. So we are in, in education not just talking about here are the mechanisms of the way your beautiful body works and here's your period and here's your hormones and here's how you relate, here's how you say yes or no or no you're not. Sorry. We, we're also saying like, you know, here's how you... Um, come in and decide whether you want to participate in something and have the dialogue practice saying yes and practice saying no and for men practice getting a no and saying ah we're not aligned here I'll have to get my needs met somewhere else in another way uh, rather than continuing to press the point so there are some current examples and pressure points in this area like nonprofits who bypass parents realsexed.org is one of those commercial entities who are targeting girls and women with period products that are at the same time delivering advanced healthcare and cultural mechanisms um, sorry advanced healthcare and cultural messaging you know so i really i really do see this shifting uh, if you're a parent and your school won't do it and you're interested in doing it consider teaching the relational aspects as part of sex ed in your own home all right, that was leverage point three. And now we're going to move on to four, which is a medical understanding of women's sexuality. Now, I've been in the business for a while now, and I can tell you about a lot of studies in summary uh, that basically make the assessment that women's bodies are worth less than men's bodies and therefore worth less research and less uh, drug development and less understanding. Um, Insurance. Do you remember when insurance was could actually say we don't cover childbirth, that that was like an add-on or something you had to fund yourself, uh, when it's literally half of the, half the male and half the female that are responsible, but the women bear the whole the cost. Not a forward-thinking collective attitude towards how to bring forth a healthy next generation of children. Uh, another topic. Um, the old story was also that women were perceived as more dramatic when they report pain. Women's pain is often dismissed, uh, was literally called hysteria, uh, which is hysterectomy. It's all like womb related. Female sexual dysfunction has a tremendous differential. Male arousal disorders have 34 drugs and women's have one and limited funding. And FSD, or female sexual dysfunction, is not even considered a treatable condition by insurance for women today. There are entire systems in the female body, like the vas clitoral organ or female ejaculation, which are still terra incognita. Medical providers often don't ask women about sex, and women don't tell because of the sexual shame. And uh, therefore, you don't really know, like, how a procedure is going to impact your sexuality or how your sexuality might be impacting something else in your body because you're a complete system. But in the new medical story, the new story, let's just shift some of those. Women are sovereign and their bodies have equal value as male bodies. That sexual well-being is considered a part of women's overall health and it's an important medical reality to take into consideration when treating anything else. For example, you know that cancer drugs have a significant deleterious impact on women's ability to have sex after the treatment. But women say that they're just never told that in advance. And the moisture loss and the pain that comes, can come with sex comes as a surprise to them. How many women who are on antidepressants know that it dries up the vaginal walls or how it impacts their overall desire for sex? How about on the pill? Uh, a lot of the things that, that the pill does to women create tremendous amount of other and unexpected side effects. 
in the future story from a medical perspective, we're going to have such a deeper understanding of the system impact of women's reproductive organs in the body. So for example, what is the role of the uterus? It does a lot more than just hold a baby and prepare to hold a baby. Uh, I think that we're going to see much less rapid progression toward organ removal in that case, for example. And of course, in the new story, all new drugs are going to be equally tested on men and women, which right now they are not. Even women's like breast cancer drugs were tested on men. So there are some people out there and some movements out there that are definitely attacking this at the edges. There's the denormalized movement where you have patient advocates who get out there and say, don't normalize your pain or your lack of satisfaction in the sexual arena. That uh, you should take that seriously and it's worth treating. You've got things like ISHWISH, the Congress on Women's Sexual Health that we're part of. You've got the emergence of an entire category of service providers to surround the doctor. Uh, paramedical services like pelvic floor therapists, sexual healers, sexuality coaches, sex therapists that have emerged. We have an episode on that as well. You have trauma-informed medical first responders that are happening now for sexual crimes. So instead of throwing a woman who's just been traumatized or a man if he's been the victim of a sexual crime into an interrogation or into a clinical setting, those crimes are met by trauma-informed specialists, which is how we should give care. We see a movement in the public sphere of using anatomically correct language, especially through social media, where instead of just saying lady bits, we say vulva and labia and heart's line, Bartholin's glands and all of that stuff. And we know what they mean. We don't just say them. We know them and know where they are and know what they do and how they feel. And then we also see the emergence as a, in medicine of an understanding of the collective trauma of sexual shame and sexual abuse and body shame and gender violence, all of that stuff that's happened over the many thousands of years that's, you know, kind of come into us, locked into us, um, are, are a part of mental health now, that we take that into account when we look at a woman's mental health. So those are all great, big culture stuff. And I'm going to go into the last grouping now of lever points and this is the one that I think we have the most control over and it's our own internalized beliefs of adherence or acceptance of cultural norms that you know don't really help us so the old stories old stories your body belongs to men and it's an object for men do you like that story I don't think so you shouldn't like sex too much that's another old story we have inherited this rape culture. Men want what they want or boys will be boys and kind of looking the other way. It's just the way it is. Get over it. Uh, bystander culture. Keep quiet. Don't rock the boat. We have acceded to domination and extraction culture where you just do what you want when you want it without really considering the system's impact of what you want. That domination or extraction culture is real. Uh, we've allowed the old story where the police and the judiciary don't enforce a lot of sexual crimes or don't take it seriously. And we've also accepted the lack of education and awareness on partner violence that somehow once you're in a marriage container or you're in a relational container, that's your private business. And it's been normalized and accepted that nobody's going to intervene. But here's some new stories. I like these new stories and I hope you like some of them also. Your body belongs to you. You can love sex as much or as little as you'd like. It's totally up to you. That people who are in power, men who are in power, the government, etc., has accountability to what happens uh, to half the population in these areas. That instead of bystander culture, we have witness culture. See something, say something. We have masculine allyship. We have consent culture. Are you into it? I'm not into it. Okay, I'll stop. Are you into it? I'm a little into it. Let's go slow. Are you into it? Yes, I'm into it. I'm a hell yes. Are you still into it? I'm still a hell yes. Are you still into it? No, I'm not into it again. Please stop. Mutually respected across the board. No drama. We will in the future celebrate women's sexual agency and joy 
And there are so many people out there that are already pushing that forward. You've got thousands of Instagram channels like Vulva Glow that emphasize healthy imagery and normalizing dialogue. You've got a vagina museum in London. You've got sexual wellness in mainstream department stores coming up. You've got books like Pussy or Reclamation and other movements like that that have been helping women make body contact with the part of themselves that's truly in the sort of goddess frame. You see where I'm going? There are other things that we could explore as levers for change, bias in economic structures, etc. But when a system is ready to be dismantled, like this one now, unwinding sexual and body shame in American women, uh, getting unhooked and unstuck from the stories that have been in the culture for generations that our mothers gave us, that our grandmothers gave us, out of their pain and out of their twisting to fit in where they couldn't have power. When a system like this is ready to come down, we can each stand from inside of our own place in it and pick one action or pressure point and then find allies in other places in the system. And it's together that we evolve ourselves and cultures and institutions. It has been very helpful for me during this research to remember that women in the West today are at a point where no women have ever been, and that this great unwinding that we're doing will likely take several more generations. Uh, To place myself firmly in the flow of history, not want it all yesterday, to see it clearly and move with it apace on a daily basis. The United Nations says it will be another 100 years for women worldwide to have equity at the current pace. And I'll tell you, this longer arc perspective does help me from getting discouraged. So coming back to my own story, I have put a lot of effort into working on sexual shame and sexual bias in North America. We invest in speaking to women directly. I pay to reach them through advertising. I continue the dialogue with newsletters and podcasts on this topic. We speak through the media and educational events about anatomy, cycle, sex, sensuality, culture. I write a lot about the importance of accepting and loving ourselves as nature. I emphasize opening our mind to new ways of thinking everywhere I can. We also educate on trauma-informed sexual expression. I think that's so vital because 35% of women have had some form of sexual trauma. And in order to really drop in and enjoy their bodies and to be freely asking for what they want and giving their yes and no, the echo of that sexual trauma has to be pushed through them so they can step into full pleasure and power in this domain. So this whole analysis has been a little bit of a sort of a big systems picture, very big picture. It's helped me to see how complex the fabric is of change and how many unexamined beliefs and biases and power structures are at work in the world in each of these separate areas. You know, I think sexual shame was a helpful adaptation in the area of patriarchy. It was useful for the protection of ourselves and our offspring, but it came at a very high cost. And as we seek to move to a synarchy or a holarchy where it's mutuality between the male and the female that is governing, offering its unique perspectives, uh, respect for all beings uh, from both sides of the gender continuum, that we will unwind sexual shame and amplify freedom and, and responsibility. So this is what I wanted to bring forth today. In each of our bodies is some old story of what we learned about being in a female body. It was, in my case, being in a woman's body was chaotic, better to control it and be like a man, sexual energy, you better get married, girl, because otherwise you don't know what to do with this explosive power. I mean, there's a lot of things that, you know, I can remember my grandmother, like, telling me what I could wear in and out of the house with a critical eye as if I was somehow supposed to know. You know, I'm sure you can come up with a hundred small examples of things that had an impact on how you thought you should be in this realm and some story that's sitting inside of your heart of hearts that's really not helping. So I wanted to spark some thought with this episode, but it really has to become personal for you. So Can I invite you to do a little journaling practice today and just find a quiet spot and think about what you learned or took in passively that is still living in your body that it would be unhelpful to unwind? 
All right. Whew, that's a lot of talking, a lot of information. So I want to close with wishing you one small movement toward the opening of the heart, more freedom and more joy today in your beautiful, perfect body. If you like this episode or you know someone who would be interested in it, please pause right now and text the link to someone, that someone. And you can find me on Instagram at the.rose.woman or my company, Rosebud Woman. And we would love to hear from you on one story that you identified in your body. So tag me, tag unwinding sexual shame, and let me know what you discovered when you went on this inner journey.